When you came in, I hope you received a sermon outline, and you can take that out, if you would, or turn in your pew Bibles to page 1,188. Our bridge class is leaving now. These are our middle schoolers who are going, and they'll be watching the sermon and discussing it together over in the church office. This is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And we read, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So far then the reading of God's word. Who is in charge of the world to come? That was the question that J.R.R. Tolkien in his magnificent trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, was unpacking for us. If you've ever read the books or seen the movies uh, of the Lord of the Rings, we come to that time in Tolkien's mind when Middle Earth is coming to an end. And who will rule? Will it be the evil Sauron? Or will it be those with good hearts, like the hobbits and Gandalf and Aragorn? Okay, spoiler alert. Is there anybody here who's never read them or seen the films? Spoiler alert. As you know, the ring of power is destroyed, and along with it, the evil Sauron is, de is, is vanquished and destroyed. And Gandalf, the white, the good, installs Aragorn as king over the citizens before him. Who will rule in the world to come? You see, Tolkien lived not with some sense that life is, and history is meaningless, but that history is moving forward. History is moving forward, and it comes to a consummation. And so, while he knows while there are spiritual battles that we face in this life, there is yet a world to come. This passage is a passage to encourage your heart and my heart this morning, to encourage your faith as you walk through life's challenges, as you face the spiritual battles of your life. I have three points for you, and you can see them in your outline. The first point is this, be encouraged. You are destined for the world to come. And then on the flip side, be encouraged. The world will be subject to the Son of Man. And the third point, be encouraged. The glorious Son of Man is in solidarity with you. So, as we begin in verse 5, I want you to be encouraged because you are destined for the world to come. Do you believe in the world to come? Christians do. And for centuries, we have spoken the words, what's called the Nicene Creed. In, in, in uh, 325, in the Council of Nicaea, uh, the, the church elders and leaders came together to affirm their faith. And near the end of that long creed that we recite, oh, four or five times a year, it speaks 
And it says, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Where did it get the phrase, world to come? Well, we find them on the lips of Jesus. Many, we find those words uh, from Jesus many times. And in Mark 10, verse 30, he's talking about the blessings of this life for his disciples. And he says, uh, you'll receive a hundredfold in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions oh, in this life. What's next? And in the world to come, eternal life. And so the world to come is identified by Jesus as that age or that place, that realm of eternal life. And it is prepared for you. Will you go there? Do you believe you will go and survive in the world to come? Some of you might remember a video that I've shown, I think twice over the past decade or so, where there's an interview of, of the man in the street. And I love those man in the street interviews. And it asks the simple question to dozens of people, what happens when you die? We get all kinds of responses. We hear, um, well, um, I don't know, go to heaven? Someone else, go to hell, go to limbo, go to purgatory. Most of the voices said, I don't know. I haven't thought much about it. And a few others said, nothing happens. When you're dead, you're dead. That's the end. But the Bible teaches us in so many places, that there is a world to come. There is a new heavens and a new earth. And one of my favorites is at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21, where we read, and you see it there in your outline, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And what a place it is as the Bible describes it. You will have a glorified body, a new body, glorified and transformed. Except you're not really going to need your tear ducts. Why is that? Because there, in that new world, there will be no more crying, no more weeping, no more sorrow, no more sin. And it says that you are transformed because you see him face to face. Unveiled, you will see the face of God. And your heart will enlarge and burst with praise and glory in the world to come. The people of Israel, the Jewish people in the ancient world, they believed in the world to come. They knew that paradise had been lost, and that's described in Genesis. But they believed that paradise would be restored, and they held to a messianic promise. And that that promise was inaugurated where in Genesis 3 when God cursed Adam and Eve and they are evicted from the garden, nonetheless, God promises that from the seed of the woman would come one who will crush the head of Satan. And God is on the move. You see, my friends, history, some of the young people in our church, they take AP history courses. Listen to me. History is not the occurring of interesting events over the passing of the dimension of time. History is under the control and the direction of God. And God has determined that he is going to bring to pass redemption of this broken and fallen earth. 
He's going to bring it to pass. And they lived like Tolkien understood. He, they lived with a view that there is redemptive progress through history. And so they waited for the Messiah to come. And they longed for that day when he would make all things new. Now, do you believe in the world to come? I have friends who don't, and I understand that. I understand that there are skeptics. What do you say to a skeptic who doesn't believe in the world to come? Well, first I listen to them, and I think it's important to listen to them and to ask them, why do you believe what you believe? And let them say why they believe what they believe, if they know what they believe and why. But then what I encourage them to do when they express doubt in the world to come is I encourage them to doubt their doubts. And that's a helpful phrase. After all, they want you to doubt your faith. Well, you can challenge them to doubt their doubts. And here's how I do that with people occasionally, respectfully. I say, well, think about it like this. In a mother's womb, can you picture twins, two babies? And they're having a conversation, and one, asks, one baby asks the other, do you believe in life after delivery? And the other replies, well, of course. There has to be something after delivery. Maybe we are here in order to prepare ourselves for what there will be later. Nonsense says the first. There is no life after delivery. What kind of life would it be? The second one says, well, I don't know, but there will be more light than we currently have here in this place. Maybe we will walk with our legs and eat with our mouths. The first one says, that is absurd. Walking is impossible. And who needs a mouth to eat? And we got an umbilical cord, and the umbilical cord gives us all the nourishment and everything we need. But that umbilical cord is short, and once we are delivered, it can't sustain us. Delivery is the end. I don't know, says that second one. I think after delivery, we will meet our mother, and she will take care of us. The first one says, mother? You actually believe in a mother? Ha! If mothers exist, then where is she now? The second one says, she's all around us. We're surrounded by her. Without her, our world could not and would not exist. And sometimes, sometimes, when you are in silence, and you listen carefully, you can hear her voice. And she speaks words of love to us. And so for some people, that's one way to help them to doubt their doubts. Christian, be encouraged. Your destiny is the world to come. Now we go to the second point, And he raises the question, who will rule? In the world to come. And I want you to be encouraged here. This is a marvelous passage of encouragement. And he raises this question, if it's not angels, then who is going to rule in the world to come? Now, you'll recall that last week, uh, the, uh, the writer to Hebrews, he took a little pause. He had been talking all about angels and, 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 and the fascination that people had with angels. Then there was this brief moment where he says, hey, watch out for spiritual drifting. <laughs> and we all need to hear that, right? But now he comes back to his point and he says, it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come. Then who is it? And now he does something fascinating. You know what he does? He quotes the Bible. He quotes Psalm 8. And this is so interesting. And, and, and I'm so grateful that he does this. Isn't it important that if you're going to teach people the truths about God that you would use the Bible? 
North Shore Community Church. This is old for some of you, but this may be new to others. What we believe and what, how we are to live is taught to us in the Bible. The scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are our rule of faith and practice. That is what we believe and how we should live. And so the writer to the Hebrews, in order to make his case on this very important point, he goes back to Psalm chapter 8. <laughs> and he picks these middle verses from Psalm 8 and applies them for the answer to this question. And he announces that the Son of Man will reign. Now, this is actually quite complicated, but you're big kids. You can understand this. And those of you in the bridge class, I know that you can understand this. Psalm 8 is this lush, gorgeous garden of Hebrew poetry. And it is filled with these truths that speak of creation in the Garden of Eden. It begins with praise. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then it speaks of how God is triumphant over all his enemies. And then it announces that God has created everything that you see and touch. And then he begins to ruminate. King David, who wrote Psalm 8, he begins to think about the creation. And though the sun and the stars and the galaxies of the universe declare his glory, he made man and woman. And he asks, what is man that you are mindful of him? We're so puny. And yet, even though we are lower than the angels, Adam and Eve and every human being is made in the image of God and is exquisitely made and is crowned with glory and honor. Every human being you meet is different from the plants and even the lower animals. Crowned with glory and honor. He goes on in ver quoting verse 6. He says, You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. This beautiful picture of humankind ruling the garden, ruling the world God has given them. And then, and then, and then the writer of Hebrews gets very realistic. And he actually makes his own comment, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he makes his own comment about this. And what does he say? In the third phrase of verse 8 in Hebrews 2, he says, At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. And at this point, the him is, that he's talking about is mankind, Adam, and Adam who represents humanity. He says, At present, this human dominion over all things is not visible. Why not? You know the answer. Because Adam and Eve blew it. They sinned. They turned and rebelled against God. And they were ejected from the garden. And the earth was corrupted. And that corruption is plain to see. And we look around this world. The people who received this letter... They did not, they were not living great lives. They were persecuted, and around them they experienced poverty, war, discrimination. Not only were there, uh, was there uh, difficulties for them, but just like today, there were bullies when their kids went to school. There were mean girls in the neighborhood. There was bankruptcy and for sale signs going up for people who'd lost it all. There was racial discrimination and prejudice. There was disease. There was even death. And yet, he says, we don't see then this dominion in this ruined world, and yet in the middle of it all, there is what one writer, Dennis Johnson, I loved what he said about this. He says, there is a spark of hope. Where? When you say they blew it and there is no dominion of man who can solve the problems of the earth, where is their hope? He says this. He says, at present, 
we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Why the not yet? Because he understands there is a flow of history. There is a flow of redemptive history, like Tolkien, who understood that history is not just interesting events that happen with the passing of time. The world is moving forward under the providence of God. And there is a future for these broken, fallen people in this broken, fallen world. And now, friends, now you have to understand, and my bow and arrow illustration that I used many times in our JCBC series, there is a trajectory from the Old Testament that launches forward and that lands in the New Testament. And when it speaks of the Son of Man being made a little lower than the angel for a time, who is then crowned with glory and honor, the writer of Hebrews says, do you know that those words penned by David, reflecting back on Adam in the Garden of Eden, are actually pointing forward to a second Adam, a perfect man, the true man who was to come, who was made, can you believe it? lower than the angels, and it, and it actually prophesies his mission on the earth to be made lower than the angels, to do what? To identify with humanity. God became flesh, was made lower than the angels, to live in the misery of this broken world. Did Jesus live in the misery of this broken world? The Son of Man came to live among us. And then we see he, got, he goes low, but how low does he go? He goes all the way down to the grave and for three days beneath the grave. And then what? Is that the end? No. He rises from the dead and he is crowned with glory and honor. I'm so glad Junior quoted in his prayer from Philippians 2, because though he was obedient to death, what did he do? He rose again and has been exalted to the highest place so that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue confess. And the writer of Hebrews breaks the suspense, quoting from Psalm 8, and he says the name for the first time, the name of this true Son of Man for the first time, and who is his name? What is his name? Jesus. And he was made lower than the angels. The suspense is over. Who is this one greater than all others? It's Jesus. Friends, angels will not rule in the world to come. In fact, we are told back in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, the angels worship him. And in verse 14, we are told the angels do his bidding. Jesus is the name above all names. And we read in Revelation 11, verse 15. Do you know this verse? It's in your program. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad it's not somebody in the Kremlin? Aren't you glad it's not somebody in the White House? Aren't you glad it's not uh, the muckety-mucks at the United Nations? Aren't you glad it's not Hollywood? He will reign forever and ever. So this leads us to point number three, and he makes it very personal. He applies it, uh, all the benefits of this, to you and to me. And he says, be encouraged, because this glorious Son of Man is in solidarity with you. What does the word solidarity mean? We're going to use it a lot over these next few weeks, so I just want you to have a working definition of solidarity. It speaks of a unity between people who are brought together and they have the same goals, the same interests. Like, like a coach, a soccer coach, 
with his soccer team, and they are in solidarity together to win the game. Like a businesswoman or a businessman, and they have employees that are working together, and that, and that business leader casts a vision and paints a picture of the goods and services that are to be provided, and together they labor together to that end in solidarity with each other. Like a pastor and his church with a vision for the kingdom coming into their community together, living together, loving one another, worshiping God and building each other up in faith, in solidarity with each other. And it's very personal. He says in verse 9, we see him now, this him, H-I-M, is Jesus, not Adam, not mankind anymore. But we see him. And the Apostle Paul tells us that though you do not see it with the retina and cornea and synapses of the human eye, Yet he prays in Ephesians 1 that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened and that you would see him and see the love that God has for you. You would see Jesus and the gospel. We see him. And I ask you, can you say with the words of John Newton who wrote that beautiful uh, hymn, Amazing Grace, what does he say? I once was lost but now am found, was blind, but now I see. It's my prayer for all of us, those of you with us online, everyone in this room, that you would doubt your doubts and that you would have eyes to see. You would stop running from him. Stop distracting yourself and fix your eyes on Jesus as we will learn to do in Hebrews chapter 12. It's personal. And when it says that he became lower than the angels and lived before us as the Son of Man, it means he became like you in your humanity. And friends, you know what this means? It means he understands everything about you. He knows you. He put on flesh. The word incarnation, fancy old-fashioned word, carne, means meat. He put on meat. He put on flesh. And it says at the end of this chapter, he became like you, made like you in all things. And when you feel alone, when you say, Nobody gets me. Nobody understands. And even think to yourself, nobody cares. You can be assured. Jesus is in solidarity with you. He became like you. He knows. He knows. And then we are told that he tasted death for you. Hebrews 9, 15, it's there in your program. It says, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Have you ever told a lie? More than once? Have you ever committed adultery? Have you ever been disobedient to your parents? Have you ever taken the name of the Lord in vain? Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? Has pride ever risen up inside your heart and you looked at another person and you said, I'm better than them? Have you ever been mean, put someone down, looked at other people with contempt? And it says, a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Oh, my friends. 
It says, by grace, he has tasted death, suffering the wages of sin, which is death for you and for me. And your transgressions are forgiven. Do you believe that? Hebrews 9, 28, it says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin. Why not? Because he already did that. But to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And just like the kids in the soccer team are so happy to see their coach and they listen to their coach, they're in solidarity together in what they do, just like people, I hope, in the church hope that their pastor has a word of encouragement for them and sends them out to be kingdom witnesses in the world. So Jesus is the ultimate captain, the great pastor, the wonderful shepherd, and he's coming again, and it says his people are in such solidarity with him, they can't wait. And I can't wait to see him come in glory to shed my sinful flesh, to see him with my new glorified eyes. He's in solidarity with you. And it says in Romans 6, verse 4, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we also walk in newness of life. For verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5, says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his... That means you're united by faith to Christ on the cross. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And he will rule the new heavens and the new earth. And you know what? In conclusion, he says, it's all by grace. Did you see that word in verse 9? He saves sinners by grace. And for my Christian friends here in this room and watching online who texted me, I see uh, who you are from your text messages. I know that many of you have walked with the Lord for decades. I look around this room, my heart is so full, as I have the privilege of knowing so many of you. And, and you haven't been perfect, but I would say by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have lived righteous lives loved what is good and hated what is evil, and you have been worshipers of the Lord. And when you discovered your sin, you actually repented of that sin, and you, by faith, uh, turned and sought hard after Christ. And I so rejoice in that. And I know the day is coming when you breathe your last and you hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your master, and your heart will swell with joy as you see him. There will be others of you whose entrance into heaven is more like uh, the thief on the cross. Anybody remember him? He was the guy that mocked Jesus. There were three of them there. He mocked Jesus with the other scoundrel. But somehow, in that last moment, he came to his senses. He understood the purity of Jesus. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he dies. And I read Alistair Begg this week when he said, you know, I always think about the relationship of the thief on the cross to when he arrives at the portals of heaven. Can you imagine the interview process for him? What are you doing here? He says, I don't know. Well, who sent you here? What? Well, n no, no one sent me here. I'm here. Well, are you... Have you been justified by faith, and do you have peace with God? I, I don't know. Well, do you know anything? Yeah. What do you know? The guy on the middle cross told me to come here. 
And that was it. Saved by grace. By grace. All of this is by grace. Whether you've been a Christian for decades, you know that every good work you ever did was just what God did in you and through you and appointed you to do, and you humbly give Him the glory. And some of you, some of you, I hope it's not, but you might get hit by a bus this afternoon. And this was the first time you actually said, I get it. I've doubted my doubts. Jesus is truly the, the Son of Man, the second Adam, and the one who has been crowned with glory and honor, and I worship him, and boom, you get hit by a bus. And you, who have become a worshiper, even in that last day of your life, you will live in the world to come. We sang the hymn last week, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you today for Jesus. And we've now heard in the book of Hebrews his name for the first time. The one who was made lower than the angels, the incarnate Son of God, who lived the life we should have lived and who died the death we deserve to die the true and perfect Son of Man. And He has now been crowned. You, Lord Jesus, have now been crowned with glory and honor. And we look to You. and We say in the words of the thief on the cross, Remember me when you come into Your kingdom. Until that time comes, Lord, we know that you have already inaugurated your kingdom. We see it by faith. We experience the power of the Holy Spirit. We have laid hold of your promises, and we want to live taking every thought captive to Christ. To love what you love, to hate what you hate, to witness for you to a lost and dying world. And if there's anyone with us today who has never before said, now this is clear to me, and I would bow the knee to Jesus, we rejoice with you. And we want to encourage you to walk before him all the days of your life and for eternity. So, receive our praises now, Jesus, Son of God. Amen.